Hi, I'm Jackie. So yeah, today I'm talking about the, the main outcomes and um, yeah, the focus of my PhD project. So um, psyllids are small sap-sucking insects that are known to vector species of Candida slibrobacter. Um, they're on cultural bacterium that can threaten crops in the Solanaceous, Apiaceae and Rataceae families. And two of major concern to Australia are the exotic pathogenic species, Candida slibrobacter solanaceaearum, um, which is the causative agent of zebra chip disease and is commonly vectored by the tomato potato psyllid. It can also affect crops in the Apiaceae family, um, vectored by other psyllids as well. Also, we're worried about Candida slibrobacter asiaticus, the causative agent of Hualong Bing, which is predominantly vectored by the Asian citrus psyllid. Before my project, no Librobacter species had been detected on mainland Australia. Therefore, the diagnostic tests for the Librobacter species had not been validated in Australia. Um, so, because Australia is a centre for psyllid diversity, we we're a bit worried because little is known about the microflora of native Australian psyllids. So we were wondering, could the microflora confound the diagnostic tests for the phytopathogenic Librobacter species? And are there uh, Librobacter species in native Australian psyllids? So this helps us understand the microflora, well, understanding the microflora of Australian psyllids is important for both biosecurity preparedness and response management of exotic diseases which Brennan just said very nicely. So as a starting point for my PhD project, we selected Echisia solanicola. So it's a native Australian uh, psyllid, but it's commonly known as the eggplant psyllid. We chose this one because it's got the host, cross, host range crossover with the tomato potato psyllid. Um, so to approach these biosecurity questions, first I just designed some generic primers to detect all known Librobacter species, those that are pathogenic and those that haven't been associated with disease, and to exclude close alpha proteobacterial relatives. Um, I checked loads of Echisia solanicola DNA extracts, um, and from the amplicons that I got, they fell within the Librobacter genus. So I needed more information. I cloned the 16S region and developed a multi-locus mapping-based sequence analysis. So this is the phylogenetic tree of the seven genes that I perform my multi-locus mapping um, sequence analysis from. Um, as we can see, this is seven genes that were able to be concatenated and strongly supported that I had a, a new Librobacter species. Um, the Echisia solanicola associated Librobacter fell within the Librobacter genus on a unique node with strong bootstrap support. So I chose to go on and name this. So we've called this Candidus Librobacter brunswickensis, which is based on where the psyllid was collected. Um, we wanted to check, does brunswickensis pause, cause, make any implications for diagnostics? So I ran some of the primary diagnostic screening tests for um, those exotic disease-causing Librobacters that we're worried about. And here we can see that Brunswickensis did generate a false positive for two tests, one for Africanus and one for Asiaticus. Um, so this did confirm our original concern that there is microflora in native Australian psyllids that can confound diagnostic tests developed outside of Australia. Um, and it is important to ensure that diagnostic tests are validated within each region. So something that's come of this is that I've been able to send sequence data and um, DNA with Librobacter, my Brunswickensis in it, to other two labs that are developing diagnostics. So this will help validate the development of CLSO diagnostics. Um, so because this discovery wasn't associated with disease, we want to know more about this Librobacter. What is its biology and what's it's actually doing? So can I detect the Librobacter in the eggplant? And if so, where? And does it replicate in there? So as a first look to answer some of these questions, I restricted 16 psyllids to one leaf on the plants and let them feed for three days, removed them, killed them. Um, and then I destructively sampled the plants at several time points. 
Um, here we can see I took 14 samples ranging from the root stem and then the midribs leaf pediole of a top, middle and bottom leaf including, and as well the inoculation leaf. So this was done on six reps and I was able to validate a high throughput extraction method and perform quantitative PCR. So the preliminary results of this is that yes, we can detect Brunswickensis within the eggplants. It is detected throughout the eggplants and high titers can be reached. So this is without the continual inoculation from psyllids feeding. Um, from these plants, Librobacter-like symptoms weren't seen, so, but that's me basing that on what people describe for other species. Um, so what's next is that I do still want to, I still have questions about the biology of Brunswickensis. So we do want to know, is there an effect to the eggplant? So more experiments are underway to, to really try and measure that. So that will be psyllids feeding with the uh, bacteria and without on plants and to really check the, the dry weights, the height, the root length of these plants. I also want to see where the Librobacter is within the psyllid. So I'm going to do this with fluorescent microscopy, so fluorescent in situ hybridisation where you bind a probe to your bacterial DNA and then you can fluoresce it and look at it under a microscope. So because my Librobacter has similar sequence to Asiaticus, I can use a probe that's, well, sequence-based, looks like I can use a probe that's already designed. And I would like to also show where one of the primary endosymbionts is. Um, so now I'm moving on to the final uh, chapter of my uh, PhD, which is much bigger. So I'm comparing the genomics of the Librobacter genus so this is in collaboration with our um, colleagues at Plant and Food in New Zealand and sort of joins into that bacterial pathovars project. So this will be the largest comparison of a Librobacter data set and includes novel species. Um, so I've got 20 genomes that are complete and are high quality drafts. And this includes seven of the nine now known species. Um, so, I'm just going to quickly talk about the phylogeny and the average nucleotide identity. So those are things that will that help us determine what a species is. Um, and then I'll also talk about some pan-genome analysis that I've been able to do and validate. Um, so here is, uh, well, okay, first of all, I performed the pan-genome analysis so I could get the core genome for the Librobacter genus. So that's what Brendan was talking about before. That's what's common to all of these Librobacter species. For me, there was 551 genes that were common in these 20 genomes. So on the right side is the phylogenetic tree of these. Um, this is great because it's quite, it's, it's, it's showing the uh, relationship of these Librobacters with a lot of confidence. Um, and right next to it, I've been able to show the average nucleotide identity, just another way of looking at the relationships between these. So we can see that there is strong support of how we've called our species. Um, what was next is that I separated the core genome from the accessory genome. So the accessory genome is anything else that is not in those 20 strains. Um, I was able to assign functional categories just to get an idea of what these Librobacters are doing. So we can see in the core genome, the majority of their, their function is dedicated to metabolism. Um, and of that, their, their, main, their main priority is energy conservation and production. Um, and then closely followed, we can see that information storage processing is another priority for the Librobacters. And of that, translation, ribosome structure, and biogenesis is their priority. Um, for the Librobacters, we saw that very little of their energy is dedicated to secondary metabolites and biosynthesis, so, which is what we did expect. Um, something else we can see very clearly here is that a lot of 
the functional category is not known, which is another thing that we expected because only two strains out of what I have assessed here have able to been, be grown in the lab and actually cultured and more assays followed up. Um, so this is another look, but actually talking about the genes that are involved. So again, we're looking at the presence, so the core in the dark blue and the absence in the light blue. Um, so this is just a, an overview of my 20 genomes, but other things that I'll be pulling out of this is information about um, effectors. So they're, they're usually quite strongly related to disease, um, like causing factors, and also the presence of phage. Um, yes, these things are what should be able to tell me, are these things common? Is this helping us know more about disease or not? Um, I'll also be one of the first ones for the Liberobacters to look at how they utilise carbohydrate. So something that's interesting so far of those is that for some of our Solanaceum strains, that they really do prioritise um, a, a casezyme which focuses as a, a lysozyme. So that is able to um, help release mature phage and helps break down bacterial cell walls. So, yeah, it, I think this type of analysis is really interesting. And although it's, you know, it's only based on genomes and we're limited to what we can confirm in the lab because they're unculturable, it is still really useful. Um, so in summary, I've found a, a novel species of Librobacter, and this was detected in the eggplant psyllid. The plant is the Plant disease associated with the presence of the bacteria has not been observed, and I was able to name this Candidus Librobacter brunswickensis based on the location. Um, so I saw that brunswickensis is transferred to eggplants, but still want to know more, um, and this will be the largest Librobacter data set for comparative genomics. Um, something that's been really good for our our team and other teams is that I have been able to send this, um, the sequence information and the, the DNA extracts to other labs for them to help validate their diagnostic protocols. Um, so thank you very much.